I swear this is not weird bait and switch. Um, Dr. Morgan Helene was here, uh, but he got disconnected or something, and I've been kind of just waiting for him to show up again. You see, I got a nice spot for him. Uh, so when he does arrive, then uh, we can get him in there. Uh, so in the meantime, we're just going to sit here and wait. I don't mean to bother you about that. Yeah, I love weird bait and switches. Yeah, isn't that great? I swear that's not what it was. Oh, wait, wait. Here we go. This is what I'm talking about. Can you hear me, Scott? I can hear you. And so Great. can everybody well, else. Connected somehow. Um, but I could see you still, so it was like, it was very strange. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't, I'm not sure what, like I said, I'm not sure what, what is exactly happening uh, with that. That was, that was, yeah, that was very uh, interesting. <laughs> um, I'm like, what happened? But I sent you an email. I don't know if you got it. But, uh, I did not actually, um, unless I went to um, a different inbox, which is a possibility here. So that's okay. You're here now, and everything is working, and everything's all set. More odds already in chat, and he'll let us know if something's wrong. Uh, so awesome. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I'm happy to to have him here. He's a, a frequent viewer from Australia. So. Uh, it's good to have him here hanging out. Um, and it's great to have you here. Um, and yeah, you know, I was looking at my my Twitter feed and I, I realized I missed seeing the Foo Fighters for the inauguration. Uh, but that's okay. Oh. I'll, I'll catch that later on, uh, on, on YouTube. Uh, and so I usually we don't talk about politics, but I it's kind of hard not to today. It's kind of like the elephant in the room. Absolutely. Uh, <laughs> So I'm kind of, you know, going against my usual rules against that, but I think that there's something that we should, you know, at least address and talk about the politics for an international audience as well, um, where we've been in the past, you know, few years, especially as it comes to science and where we might be going in the future for, for science um, under a new administration. Uh, what are your thoughts? So I think you hit the nail on the head. I'm, you know, really excited about the new administration coming in, um, you know, being very committed to science and, you know, making, um, you know, a science advisor, a cabinet level position and everything. Um, you know, I feel like the past, you know, four years have been um, a lot of, you know, science either being ignored at best or attacked at worst, <laughs> I would say. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, it's just, you know, breath of, fresh, breath of fresh air, so to speak, to have that you know, front and center again. So um, I'm yeah, super excited yep. to have, you know, science, uh, you know, a pro science administration. So. Yep. Ag agreed. Agreed. There is, you know, so much that, and, and I've talked about this before on this stream with other scientists where many in politics don't understand the importance of basic research. You know, they just see research and it's like, you're funding that. That's not going to help you know, cure cancer or address this specific issue we're having, you know, in in society. Uh, and that just shows a, a fundamental misunderstanding of, of what basic research does. Um, and, you know, do you do any basic research in your lab? Um, that kind of it falls under maybe that umbrella of why is that even useful? Absolutely. I would say that 90% of my research that I've done has been, uh, you know, basic research as opposed to um, applied research. Mm -hmm. And I feel like, you know, like you said, so many people are, um, you know, how does, how will this help me? You know, where's my money going? Um, you know, they don't see the impact of basic research, but when you think right. about things like, you know, CRISPR genome editing, um, you know, that came out of studying a basic, you know, um, came out of basic research, you know, a bacterial immune system that they, you know, that we um, were able to harness into a, uh, tool for genome editing and another example is the COVID vaccines that came out or, you know, starting to can make a vaccine using, you know, mRNA and then deliver it into, into, um, into human cells and everything. So, um, mm -hmm. for me, it's when I'm doing, you know, basic research, sometimes it's kind of, 
Um, you know, it can feel like, you know, how all this, where's this going to go? Is it going to go anywhere? But, you know, it's really, you know, putting in place those, you know, fundamental building blocks that, um, you know, that's where, you know, big advancements happen. So, and it's, you know, part of what, one thing I really want to do more is, um, you know, get that out to the public that, you know, this research, mm -hmm. you know, is very impactful, even though it seems like it's, may seem like it's not going anywhere, you know, from, um, you know, minute by minute or day by day, but, um, you know, science builds on itself. So, um, you know, that's where all the big, you know, big, uh, the big breakthroughs happen, so. Yep, and are there still a lot of opportunities in basic research uh, for, for students that want to get into, uh, you know, science? Absolutely, so that's how I got involved in science to begin with. Um, so I'm a plant biologist by training and, you know, mainly molecular biology for the most part. And I started studying this model system, uh, Arabidopsis. So it's kind of like the, the lab mouse of the plant world, I would say. Mm -hmm. You know, it's the first plant to have its genome sequenced and everything. So, um, and I actually started working with, you know, that model system as an undergraduate researcher. So, and for me, it was a bit serendipitous, I would say, you know, just emailing, um, you know, do you have any openings in your lab? And I almost ended up in a an HIV lab, interestingly, interestingly enough. But I was just really caught by this question of, you know, plants having an immune system. You know, it's something that a lot of people don't think about, I feel like. You know, we, you know, especially with, you know, COVID now and, um, you know, the flu, um, HIV, other diseases like that. You know, a lot of people don't think about, you know, the corn that they're eating, <laughs> you know, has an immune system also. Yeah. So, That's and so cool. I would say... Um, you know, especially, you know, students and um, undergraduates, you know, if there's something that interests you that's, you know, um, you know, basic research, whether it's, you know, biology or physics or, you know, whatever, um, whatever your field of interest might be, um, you know, reach out, you know, send an email. It's really scary to do that, you know, as a student to um, mm. email a professor. <laughs> um, you know, I still get it's still emailing. scary for me <laughs> when I email people to do this. I'm like, because I email a lot of people and I'm like, you know, what, how, am I going to come across as, you know, this or it, it's, it's nerve wracking. Um, Absolutely. I'd like, I'd like to welcome in uh, Gathwaggle who's here. She's an organic chemist and uh, teacher. So uh, hey, good to have going? you here. Uh, you can check out her stream. She actually streams for her, her students, some classes, and she makes cheese. So, uh, oh, nice. Actually, I think I have. Yep. There you go. <laughs> awesome. So, yeah, thanks again for being here. Um, I feel bad that I'm going up against uh, Foo Fighters, it sounds like. So, <laughs> thanks for, uh, for coming yeah. tonight. No, this is great. Um, and so, you know, you touched on that importance of basic research. And one of the things that I've been doing recently um, as I've started looking more into academia and, 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 and talking to more people in academia that I haven't done in a while. You know, I'm an eighth grade science teacher mainly. Um, hey, Uncle Bill, welcome in. Uh, I started lurking on the PhD chat on Twitter. That place is scary. Uh, I, if you lurk on there enough, you would never want to be a PhD student. Uh -huh. Um, you know, and it, I think it's, you know, especially now with like the, a lot of the mental health, you know, coming to the forefront. Um, do you see that changing at all, especially for, you know, underrepresented groups that, you know, PhD programs can be so arduous as to be a big turnoff for someone who actually might end up being uh, good in that profession? Absolutely. That's a really great, great point. And, you know, you look at the statistics of, um, you know, anxiety and depression amongst uh, PhD students, and it's, you know, through the roof, the levels of, um, you know, these um, mental problems that can come up during PhD programs. And that's definitely, you know, a turnoff, like you said, for a lot of students. But for me, I think that just talking about it now, like you mentioned, the PhD uh, Twitter, um, uh conversations that are going on i think just you know talking about those issues 
you know, is very important and helpful and you know, having it out in the open and, you know, kind of uh, removing the, the stigma associated with, with things like anxiety and depression. So mm-hmm. um, I think it's definitely a turnoff, but I think that, you know, things are moving in the, in the right direction by, um, you know, even just having the conversations now that we're having, you know, openly and honestly. So, right. Yeah. And I've kind of seen that on Twitter where people will reach out and be like, Oh, I'm feeling like, like this. Does anyone have anything that would help me? Um, and, and I think sometimes you can feel lonely in your own lab, you know, or sometimes teachers in their own classrooms where you might not have that support. And thankfully with the internet, you, you can try to find some of that support structure that you might not have, you know, locally. Um, and I, you know, it is promising. At least we are having that conversation now where, you know, we can kind of at least maybe address some of those mental health issues to make it less, uh, you know, more successful for more people, I think. Absolutely. And I think, you know, online, you know, Twitter is a great, uh, you know, place for that to happen also. Um, you know, I feel like so many people are, um, you know, myself included, you know, it's kind of scary to talk about those things in person sometimes. So, um, to, you know, have that kind of online um, forum is really, is really helpful. So, yeah. Yeah, I also noticed that there's a lot more uh, Discord groups coming out for specific groups as well. I don't know if you have seen that or too familiar with Discord. Um, Mm -hmm. Pretty much if you have a a, a specific uh, group that you want to be part of, um, there's probably a Discord for you with groups of people with the support structure uh, to to help you out. Um, Have you you seen some of those? I've seen some of those. you know, kind of here and there. And, you know, Discord's another, um, you know, great avenue for those dis- discussions also. So, um, you know, I'm mainly on Twitter, I feel like, but, <laughs> um, you know, it's great to you know there are multiple, uh, multiple forums, so. Yep. So let's just talk for a second about your, uh, the research that you do. We really haven't gotten into that yet. Maybe I also want to know your, uh, your background story, like, like you didn't just wake up one day and you were like, oh yeah, I want to do plant immunology. You kind of alluded to a little bit of that, but always curious about people's middle school experience on as well in those mm-hmm. formative years um, of developing that love of science that you have. So if you could go into a little bit of that first um, and then into the research. So, you know, I feel like a lot of people, um, you know, students, especially like middle school students, they, you know, were interested in so many different things. Um, I was actually more interested, I would say, in science fiction as opposed to, you know, actual biology, I would say. Um, you know, so I was writing, you know, sci-fi stories and stuff. Um, and then it was, I remember very specifically as an eighth grade middle school student, I um, had a teacher who was very, very strict, I would say. Um, and you know, this was a you know eighth grade science class, which I loved. I um, you know, I was and I remember one time I was, you know, like labeling all the parts of the cell, you know, all the different organelles and everything. And, you know, I had all of them labeled and then there was one thing I was, you know, going to change and then I, my pen ran out of ink. So then I, you know, tapped my friend, you know, to ask for a pen. And then, you know, she saw me tap him and then, you know, what would have been a hundred score, she just ripped it up and threw it away. <laughs> so it was a very intimidating class, I would say. Um, and I feel like so many students in middle school have this stigma that science is scary. Um, you know, maybe it's a scary teacher that they have, or it's just, you know, this fear of, you know, science, there's math, maybe someone's afraid of math and numbers. So um, there is a stigma that's there. Um, so I would, I would say, um, even if I would give advice for, you know, uh, middle school students, um, you know, even if it's, it seems scary, you know, um, you know, if that's what you're interested in, you know, follow your, you know, interests as much as possible. Um, and you know, so for middle school to high school, I was always like, you know, bouncing back back and forth between um, 
science and literature, I would say. And even in, you know, as an undergraduate in college, I was, my degree was in English. It wasn't even a science degree. Um, you know, I was, you know, my thesis was um, sci-fi adaptation in, uh, from literature to film. So, um, you know, it was not until, you know, pretty late, relatively late that I uh, come, kind, of, you know, kind of committed to science. So, um, you know, it's, I feel like a lot of uh, students feel like they have to commit or know what they're doing with for the, for the rest of their life. But, um, you know, that's not the case at all. Um, don't feel this pressure that like every decision is going to affect your future in some horrible way or something, or, you know, or some good way potentially. So, um, you know, just give yourself some grace and um, don't be too hard on yourself for not, not having it figured out as a middle school student, I would say, because okay. that's, um, you know, that's a good time to just explore your interests. And, um, you know, it's always, you can always, you know, do something different if you're not, if that's not your thing. So. Yeah. And it's like, you know, I've spoken to so many people and you've met people that forget, you know, middle school making a decision. You're in graduate school and you decide <laughs> that, you know what? <laughs> I'm not going to go pre-med. I want to go pre-law. You know, it's you know, yeah. <laughs> there there are people that do that. I think they're crazy, and I don't I don't get it, but <laughs> it does happen, you know. Um, and but I think a lot of that just goes if if you have a good foundation in the basics with school, you know that good habits and reading. You know, I think reading is a key thing for you. Was obviously science fiction. Uh, was you're into the reading. Um, and, and that's, that's huge. And, and like, whatever that outlet is, I think that's what we should have kids, you know, embracing just to get, cause it doesn't matter what you read research has shown. It's just that you're reading, um, except maybe text messages. I'm not sure if that was, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, I totally agree. And, um, and, you know, reading is one of those things that's so transferable, um, you know, scientists, we're reading papers all the time. We're, you know, getting information from those um, research papers. So, um, you know, my English background, you know, helped me out a lot in that in that way. So, and I like you, how you mentioned the, um, you know, that's not necessarily the type of material that you read, but it's, you know, it's as long as you're reading and getting something out of it, I would say. Because I remember, this is, you know, this is another story from way back when, when I was in fifth grade, we had this like free reading period where we just mm -hmm. have, you know, have an hour to read something. And I remember that I, one day I brought this like Pokemon video game guide about how to like evolve the Pokemon and everything. <laughs> and then my teacher got mad. She's like, she's like, Morgan, that's not, um, what's the term she used? That's not You know, a worthy. That's not, that's not, that's not worthy, appropriate really. for our reading time. Exactly, yeah. not appropriate. <laughs> not appropriate material. So, like that was kind of a <laughs> sad, but um, you know. But I think you know, as long as you're reading, um, you know, things that you're interested in and you're um, absorbing that information, yeah. that's really important. So now I got a funny story today in class. I had, actually <laughs> have this is my larger class. There was like eight kids in there, but. The one kid turns around. He's like, I'm not reading your text message. You sent me an essay. <laughs> the other kid was indignant. He's like, he was like, what? I sent you something to read or whatever. And I just thought it was hilarious. And and I, I, I look at the kid. I'm like, you sent him an essay. But I bet in English class, when a teacher asked you to write a paragraph, you were like bent out of shape that it was too much writing and that she was being extra about it. He was like, yeah, <laughs> I'm like, like you could write an, an essay text message, but you can't write, you know, something for English class. I'm like, come on. So that was, that was our laugh. They thought it was kind of funny. That was a good conversation, <laughs> but welcome in Nikita. Well, thanks for being here in our conversation. And we were just hearing about uh, the past <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> and working our way up. So, yeah, eighth grade is a formative year in high school, but yeah, you definitely can't get settled in what you want to do. I think I knew I always wanted to do science in some way, but I never knew exactly what it was. You know, 
I definitely didn't plan on being a science teacher when I was in eighth grade. That's for sure. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm leaving a message in the chat. Let's see if it goes through. <laughs> oh, I thought I had a Twitch um, account. I'll just, yeah, thanks for coming, everyone. <laughs> I was going to leave a message down there, but. You can figure that out later, maybe. Exactly. Yeah, <laughs> but uh, so you met through your past a little bit. Uh, now, this is where I, I know for some uh, academics, putting what you research into simple terms for the general public, even though there's a lot of science people in the chat. <laughs> um, <laughs> so what exactly is it that you're researching in your lab? So like we have an immune system, plants have, an Im have immune systems also, and for example, we have, we have vaccines that are coming out against COVID-19. Unfortunately, you can't really vaccinate a plant because we have, an, you know, we have this adaptive uh, component to our immune system. So, you know, we can get, get a vaccine and then our immune system can learn to recognize new diseases. But with plants, basically what they're born with is what they have. So this is, uh, you know, they just have in, we call it an innate immune system. So from the from the seed to when they mature to when they die, they have, you know, kind of what they're born with is what they have. And so the way that plants uh, protect themselves against diseases, they have multiple layers of defense. So like, you know, we have, you know, our skin is kind of that outer layer of, um, you know, protecting us from diseases and things. Plants have this waxy cuticle is what we call it. So that's, you know, on the, on their, uh, on their outside, so that that's a barrier from, you know, viruses and bacteria and fungi trying to get in. Um, so, but bacteria are very, you know, bacteria, for example, are very clever, so they can find ways to get into the plant still. So, for example, maybe a caterpillar chews on the plant and makes a wound, and then the bacteria can get in that way. Or there are these things called stomata, which are primarily for gas exchange, but you know that that those are holes that. The bacteria can enter into the plant also so and then once the bacteria are inside the plant um just for one example um uh, plants have these we call them resistance proteins that can detect the you know detect proteins that are coming out of the bacteria so kind of like um you know our, our immune system can detect if you're vaccinated against COVID, you can detect mm -hmm. the, you know, the spike protein, for example. Right. Um, you know, exactly. Yeah. Plants have these proteins that can detect parts of the, um, uh, you know, the threat that's, that they're facing. And how do you make a plant, you know, more immune to diseases? So one thing that we do is called uh, gene stacking. So putting in um, a lot of these R genes to kind of, um, you know, make plants that can recognize, you know, a bunch of different uh, pathogens, I would say. And, you know, we also do a lot of, you know, genetic modifications, so making, you know, GMO plants that are resistant against diseases. And, you know, that opens up a, um, you know, a public discussion. You know, a lot of people are afraid of GMOs still. Um, you know, it's one of those things that, you know, it doesn't seem, you know, natural or, you um, you know, seems like it's, you know, scary, but, um, you know, the, the way that, you know, we do it, it's very, you know, it's very safe, um, you know, mm -hmm. to get a you know, corn that's resistant against, you know, certain disease, um, you know, it does have to go through all those, you know, government uh, regulation channels and everything. So, um, you know, there's never been a case of anyone, you know, having some sort of, um, you know, bad, bad effect to eating a, you know, genetically modified plant. So I'm going to let my cat in. She's <laughs> scratching right. the door here. <laughs> we always got to take care of the animals. Absolutely. <laughs> Get those cats in there. <laughs> now, I want to go into a little bit of what I know about plant diseases and immunity. All right. I know of like two things. Mm -hmm. Galls that plants form around, you know, diseased areas to basically it's kind of like when you have a virus on your computer and it takes it and it sets it aside so it can't get anywhere else 
And then there's, of course, the uh, tobacco mosaic virus, which everyone learns about in school, I think, you know, as you yeah. know, your primary form of like plant disease that you hear back. But there are, of course, lots of different kinds of mosaic viruses for, for plants. So that's kind of like, I think, where most of us have this experience of knowing about plant immunity besides plant defenses like thorns and whatever that's different uh but uh mm-hmm. but i think that's usually like where most people come from when uh, when approaching you know plants um and not getting into the too much of the molecular piece of it um so what are, what are some other common things that maybe in the chat you, they can mention a few things that they might know about plant immunity I mean, those are the only two I can think of right now. Uh, what are some other common things? See if anyone mentions anything. There are some science people in there. I know it, but I don't know oh, if they're going to mention anything. This is like me at school. I'm like, all right, someone put in chat the answer to the question I'm asking. And then it just goes quiet <laughs> for like five minutes. And then the one kid pipes up and asks to go to the bathroom, even though they're at home. <laughs> <laughs> Which is always funny. Um, nothing. Yet. Oh, here we go. I'm working and wasn't paying attention. <laughs> Classic. No. Uh, I can throw out a few fun examples while yeah. people. Uh, yeah. What are some fun examples? Here? So, one example I like to bring up is the Irish potato famine that was mm. devastating, and that was caused by a. A lot of people think it's a fungus, but it's an uh, omycete pathogen. Um, and so one thing that we're doing is, you know, trying to find ways to make potatoes that are more resistant against this um, potato famine uh, pathogen. And interestingly, you know, the, these big potato farms, um, very susceptible to, you know, these diseases. So a lot of fungicides are put into the soil which can get into the potatoes. And then, you know, that, that's something that you don't want to eat mm-hmm. a lot of necessarily. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, trying to make potatoes that are more resistant so that you don't have to use all those, you know, dangerous chemicals. So mm-hmm. now I've also yeah, rust. Yeah. What is that? The, the rust kind of like what we get on our cucumbers <laughs> yeah, <laughs> or whatever, you know, or on the roses. Yeah, often get like a rust as well yeah so, and like that, a lot of these um yeah wheat rusts uh kind of like look kind of rusty <laughs> you know on the on the plant so that's kind of a you know name that fits the you know fits how it looks <laughs> so right and this is the kind of thing that's inherent with like the blight in a monoculture where you don't have that diversity and you know because of the green revolution a lot of these endemic species, you know, are are no longer around, um, and I and I know one of the things that uh, that botanists are are trying to do is find some of these genes from these older endemic species that they can then use um, and either breed into or you know genetically alter uh, plants as well. Um, is that something that that you have seen? Yep, that's a great point. So the yeah the first the first point you mentioned um, yeah the monoculture that's really can potentially be very bad a lot of times you know if you you know like you mentioned you have this field of you know clones of the same genotype then you have a pathogen that comes in and then you know can wipe out the whole entire field and uh, the second point you mentioned and that's definitely something that we're also doing um, you know finding new resistance genes in these you know as I mentioned these you know, um, more ancient varieties or these wild, uh, wild species and then breeding, breeding them in or identifying them and then, and then modifying them. Um, and, you know, we've been doing this for thousands of years, you know, going, when, mm-hmm. you know, going back in our history and everything. So it's not, even though, you know, before we knew what a gene was, before we knew what DNA was, um, you know, this is what we were doing. So, um, and, you know, that's, you know, so yeah, no one can, I think, you know, no one's going to be uh, afraid to eat, um, you know, a plant that's been, the genes have been bred in as opposed to, you know, genetically modified, so. 
I have a question. Do you have like mm-hmm. your own garden? Do you have like your own like plants? And do they ever get like diseased? And you're like, God dang it, that disease got my plant. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't have a garden, unfortunately. Um, I'm here in New York City, so don't, not a lot of uh, space, unfortunately. But I do have some plants that I've kind of hanging on the wall here. Um, they're doing pretty well. I feel like I'm, you know, for someone who studies plants, I feel like I have a pretty bad green thumb, no green thumb, so to speak. Uh, so um, you know, I'm happy that they're doing, um, you know, doing, you know, they're thriving in this. Uh, you know, limited sunlight that we've been getting here. So, yeah. Well, I had an oceanographer on the chat about a month ago, and he had never been on the ocean. So, uh-huh. <laughs> that's fine. Right. You well, have a so question. You have a question in chat too. If you want to check out, Nikita has a question. One of my little... air plants that I have. There you go. Uh-huh. Have there been any modifications using CRISPR? Yep, there's a lot of that happening now. And actually, so CRISPR, uh, two of the uh, Nobel laureates, uh, Jennifer Doudna and um, Charpentier, who won the Nobel Chemistry Prize, they actually think that a lot of, you know, CRISPR's biggest impacts are gonna be in agriculture, you know, even before, you know, human health, um, human health applications so um yeah i've i've used um crispr plants in my you know, crispr plants in my experiments and everything so um i feel like almost every you know plant molecular biology lab is you know modified plants with crispr so is that like a standard technique now in molecular biology kind of like you know pcr was you know back like you know, 30 years ago became a standard practice in lab. Now CRISPR is yep. kind of that standard practice. Yep. Now it's almost every lab, you know, every molecular biology lab I feel like is doing it now. It's really, um, it's amazing how, you know, quickly it's taken off. I think the, the paper was published in 2012, I think, that where they first knew that you could uh, edit DNA with it. So, you know, in less than 10 years, it's become like you mentioned kind of like wow. a pcr uh standard almost so you know you can even do it in your in your garage now so <laughs> that's amazing <laughs> that's crazy good question yeah, and i've been doing i've been doing some um some nonprofit work here and there a little bit um there's a lab it's unfortunately it's closed now due to covid but um um, and it's a community biology lab where you can, you know, students can come in and do their own PCRs and extract DNA from themselves and all that. So you know, that, that was a lot of fun. Um, hopefully it opens back up again, but you know, we're not too confident, um, that it's going to open again, but, um, you know, hopefully it, it can open. And if not, then that might be kind of a fun side project, uh, you know, kind of make a you know, another community biology lab to succeed it. So. Yep. So I will say one of the, you know, labs that I'll do when I do teach bio lab is the classic, you know, DNA extraction from either strawberries or bananas or, or whatever. Cause it's so easy to do. Yeah. Um, and you can get pretty good results with pretty basic materials just from the store. Um, yeah. And then if it's a little while, they can take their DNA home in. Yep. Yeah, I remember doing the DNA um, for the banana in, that was eighth grade. Yeah, I remember that, you know, with the uh, the scary teacher. <laughs> but, you know, it, was, it was a lot of fun. And um, you can also, you yeah, have that like kind of visual, you know, visualization of the of the DNA there also is really, uh, you know, having something that the students can see, I think is really important. Yeah. Um, you know, it's, especially, you know, molecular level stuff, it's hard to, Oh yeah. Explain things. You can't see it with your eye, I feel like. So yep. it's always nice to have like a visual, you know, visual yep. thing there. So you have a question in chat if you want to read that. See, I heard that some plants sorry to move this over a little bit. <clears throat> were modified to try to be vaccines that are easily deliverable. Are you able to speak on that at all? I think I read about this experimentation in potatoes. That is a great question. And 
so yeah, one thing that we're doing is using plants as these kind of like bioreactors to kind of farm um, farm antibodies, basically. And a lot of this is done in tobacco species are really good for this. They can express these at you know very high levels and everything. So, and I think that someone was doing this with um, COVID antibodies, I think. <clears throat> so um, yeah, it's pretty exciting. No exciting research that's going on in that. I haven't done it personally yet, but um, you know, I think a lot. You know, mm -hmm. it's becoming more and more um, uh, commonplace. I would say. So that's similar to what um, you would do in like yeast. Sometimes you would try to get it to produce a certain, uh, you know, protein or antibody expression. Exactly. Except instead of using yeast, you're going to use potatoes or whatever. Exactly. And like, yeah, like, yeah, yeast mm -hmm. is a great example. Um, you know, E. coli is, um, you know, almost every lab uses that to, um, you know, get large amounts of protein. So, um, yeah, a lot of different, um, sorry, my cat's getting out. <laughs> um, you know, a lot <laughs> of out, different, um, you know, systems you can work with. So, yep. Awesome. I'm glad we have some great questions here. Yeah, these are really great, awesome. great questions. I'm glad I don't have to come up with all the questions, even though I usually <laughs> have lots of questions. So, <laughs> so, um, so I do have several other topics we can we can talk about since uh, we got you here that were on the list, and uh, we got some more you know serious topics, and then we can lead into a more you know humorous, uplifting ending. Uh, to our chat as well. Um, so I know you have worked with, you know, promoting uh, diversity in the sciences. Do you want to speak to that at all? And, you know, your impetus for doing that, you know, over this past year and where you see it going? That's a great, great question. So I want to start off by saying that a lot of you know, for me, for example, you know, coming up through middle school, high school, college, um, I didn't have a black science teacher until I actually don't think I ever had one actually. <laughs> um, so, and, and I didn't really work one on one with, you know, another black professor until I was doing postdoc research. So, there's not a lot of scientists who are in those positions who look like me, I would say. And, you know, the same can be said about, you know, women are underrepresented. Um, you know, there are so many different groups that are underrepresented in science, I would say. And just having someone who looks like you in those positions has really been really um, important for me, I would say. And also helpful in getting, you know, getting more, um, more people in science. So, and so a lot of this started over this past summer, um, after um, George Floyd's killing and Breonna Taylor's killing, and um, there's the Central Park bird watching incident with uh, Christian Cooper and Amy Cooper um, earlier this earlier last year, and so there was this kind of social media movement that started with Black Birders Week, and then so then we made this um, Black Botanist Week as kind of a follow up to that. And then, you know, there was you know, almost every week there was a different, you know, different one. There was like a black mammals week, a black, um, you know, black in neurobiology, et cetera. And just have that kind of online community because we didn't have it in our, per in our uh, real world lives, I would say, it was really, um, really amazing. And we had so many, um, you know, just a very positive, uplifting, experience we had so many good we got you know got a lot of really good feedback from it um even yes yeah, so many people were involved um mc hammer the rapper got involved in it um margaret atwood the author got involved um you know actors and musicians and you know people even outside of science were uh, you know pulled into it which was amazing um and it's and it's actually going to be, you know, continuing on, you know, this year. And we're doing a big um, 
kind of a big conference with all the different groups together. Um, and then we're trying to do probably not in person for this year with COVID and stuff, but you know, at least like an online um, type of conference, I would say. And um, also, I was very excited that, so I'm close to story quickly. Um, I was very excited that, so Science Magazine does this breakthrough of the year every year for like a scientific discovery. And we were actually one of the one of the runners up for that. Um, you know, of course the COVID vaccines won that award, but it was really amazing mm -hmm. to be, you know, to be honored by them in that kind of way, so. Yeah, you no, know, one of the things I thought would be nice to have is a calendar with like all the weeks lined out in it with, you know, mm -hmm. some pictures to go with it. You know, I could hang that up in my classroom or I could hand them out to kids. You know, I would be definitely behind that. If you want an idea, <laughs> you know, for that could be even a fundraiser because um, that would be excellent. So there, there's my idea to you. <laughs> Thank you, Scott. Um, I actually wrote that down and I will credit you for that idea. <laughs> That would be um, amazing. And I'm, I'm trying to think of some way with my students to try to get them, because I know they're on social media, and I know that, you know, some of them would be into it. And it's sometimes, even I have a hard time following what week it is in anticipating what's going to happen. Um, and then, you know, there are some primary people that are kind of leading that or, or you know, co-leading uh, that particular chat and they have their own websites and it goes pretty deep. You can go down some rabbit holes on social media with this, uh, which I've done. Um, but I think it'd be a good way to reach kids in particular to have something like that uh, as, a, as a reference. Maybe, I don't know if they would know what a calendar is, but I don't know, it's an idea. <laughs> That's a fantastic idea. And then I, I like your idea about, you know, having a picture there, like using a logo for the different, so, you know, every, all these weeks have their own logo that they made and they're all really, you know, fantastic, so. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, you know, good, you know, if not a fundraiser, you know, just having that physical thing that you can give out to students and give out to having a professor put it up in there, hang it up in their office also. So that's a fantastic idea. I'm, I wrote it down mm -hmm. and I'll give you credit yep. <laughs> for that idea. So. Yeah. I haven't seen black and cancers. Logo. I have to look at it, but some of them are very nice. And, and I will say it kind of took at least science Twitter. It took it by like storm. Um, Absolutely. because you you couldn't have been a science person on in twitter and not have seen what week it was but then the problem was you would still have people posting like a month later like i you know i still have black <laughs> birds you know on my you know my tweet deck you know because people constantly are, are posting to a lot of these um mm -hmm. and so is it it's a it's definitely something that you know it's word of mouth as well as that that social media presence and it it definitely made an impact um, for, for, I was, the, for the better. Absolutely. I, I think we were all just like blown away by, um, you know, like you mentioned how it kind of took over Twitter, I would say we were just, you know, pleasantly surprised about that. So it was really amazing. Yep. So I'm reading some of the chat here. <laughs> yeah, these logos were uh, really amazing. Yeah, I really like the calendar idea. That that would be fantastic. I mean, stickers are always good too, but um, exactly. each individual week could make their own stickers. But <laughs> exactly. Plus, there are like um, so many, uh, you know, so many different weeks that are that are out there now. Just having um, keeping track of like which, you know, which what's happening during mm -hmm. which week. So you can kind of like look forward, you know, kind yep. of a you know plan ahead also. So yeah, yeah. And going back to your, your, your talking about how like you didn't have a certain, you know, type of teacher until you got, you know, much older, you know, even myself as a, a male, I have students come to me in eighth grade and they're like, you're the first man teacher I've had. And I'm mm -hmm. like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, and I've even seen that with kids because, you know, I, the rest of my team I work with, they're, they're all women, they're, they're, they're great people. And certain kids will talk to, you know, men or talk to women with certain issues and problems. And, and I think that's where, you know, a certain 
you know, our, our difference, differences can be beneficial uh, for the differences that we have in students. Like every student should have someone, you know, on staff at a school to be able to go to um, that they feel comfortable with. And you don't know who that's going to be, right? Especially as they're getting older and they're changing, right? And they're, you know, eighth grade, nothing makes sense anyways. Having <laughs> someone there that is like them or that they can relate to is uh, is so important. Absolutely. And I, I still remember, you know, being a middle school student and, um, yeah, like yeah, having someone you can talk to and that you feel comfortable to, you know, reach out to and everything. And yeah, like you said, like, you know, eighth graders, like, it seems like nothing makes nothing makes sense, I would say. Um, and it seems like, but just, you know, being able to talk to someone and then realize that everyone's going through that, you know, those changes and everything. So uh, uh, I feel like a lot of eighth graders, they feel like they're weird or they're the, you know, oddball, so to speak. Um, but just to know that, um, mm -hmm. I feel like that's, you know, part of being an eighth grader. <laughs> so. Oh yeah, you realize that later. And you're like, wow, exactly. that sucked for everybody. <laughs> what do you know? Except that one kid who seemed okay through the whole thing. Um, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. yeah, it's like something that, you know, later on you uh, realize. Yeah. That's one of the but, things uh, I asked teachers on like, or like as a teacher, I asked parents on parent night. I'm like, who here liked eighth grade? And like, there's like 20 <laughs> parents and like one parent will raise their hand about liking, you know, being a teenager. I'm like, there you go. You understand oh. your kids a little bit better. <laughs> <laughs> It's pretty miserable sometimes, but I tried to make Absolutely. it a little bit less so. Um, in, You're in, doing really amazing. That's I wish I had you as a teacher in, in eighth grade. You know nothing about my class. I could be terrible in the actual <laughs> classroom. You have no idea. <laughs> yeah, this, this, this scary teacher that I had, it was, I'm still, I still kind of wake up at night sometimes and it's like. Oh, geez. That's <laughs> pretty bad. That? <laughs> That's pretty bad. You know, my, my goal is always that they they leave thinking that they can do science and that you know it's not something they don't want to do you know exactly yeah, we'll wait for high school and then the scary teachers in the high school will you know dissuade them from being scientists exactly <laughs> yeah you get it's the vibe i give off i'm not like you know i'm not serious at all <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't like confrontation is one thing like I will laugh before I yell usually which is a good thing because I'd be yelling all day <laughs> exactly you know, you know I, I kind of I tried to do the tough teacher thing for one year I was like I was like my second or third year I'm like I'm gonna be the tough teacher I'm gonna like not smile till Christmas and I'm gonna like lay down the law you know and halfway through there I'm like I am miserable this is like mm. the worst job ever. And I'm like, I'm doing this all wrong. <laughs> I'm like, I'm miserable. The kids are miserable. Everyone's miserable. If nothing oh. else, I'm going to have a good time. <laughs> I don't know about them, <laughs> but I'm at least going to have fun doing some science. <laughs> if you don't want to exactly. have fun doing science, fine. Be miserable. You know, <laughs> the rest of us are going to mix chemicals together and see what happens. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I feel like it's just, very contagious also you know if, you know if you're having fun then that definitely you know rubs off so mm -hmm. and it's you know it's a win-win uh win 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 scenario so yep so who was what was your do you teach classes right now currently not i'm actually applying for <clears throat> professor positions right now actually so okay. um in the past i've taught um taught some classes um I was in South Korea for a couple of years and um, did some teaching out there also. <clears throat> and I just, I, I, I love teaching. It's, um, you know, when you're having fun, then, you know, I think, you know, they're also having fun. So you're missing um, the, the whole teaching during COVID thing though. You kind of, you, you missed that year. <laughs> yes. I was going to say that. Thankfully, I don't, don't feel like you're missing it. <laughs> I cannot. I cannot imagine what that's like. And I am, um, you know, I've been you know, talking to people about it and reading about it. And um, you're 
absolutely heroes for doing that, even in a getting it to work at all, you know, I would say. So I would also um, say every yeah. parent that is a hero as well. If you mm-hmm. have, especially if you have younger kids or even, you know, teenagers, good God at home, you know, and you're trying to get all that stuff together. If you have like more than like, I don't know, one kid or two kids, I mean, can you imagine families with like five kids? I mean, all right, they're at home, you're stuck there with them. Like I'm at school, I usually have a couple kids. I can handle a couple kids. Five of my own mm-hmm. kids at home, that would be a nightmare. <laughs> Absolutely. You can't get away. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. You're stuck in, together, quarantined in a house. <laughs> okay, so yeah. I give a lot of you know credit to uh, all the parents out there that are doing the best for their kids, trying to get this to work too. Um, Absolutely. I, I don't use the term uh, heroes lightly. It's really, it's really amazing that they're doing that. Oh, thank you for the congratulations, um, Gethweigel. I probably pronounced that uh, incorrectly, but. Yeah, soon you'll be a member of the teaching ranks. Yeah, I am. I, I love it. One one of the um, most fun things that I, you know, courses that I taught, it was a uh, botany lab course. And just, you know, being able to, show them, you know, actual plants, and we would go outside and, like, identify plants, and then I would have them, you know, sketch, you know, pick a plant and then sketch it and label the label the parts. Um, we had this cool, it's called a <clears throat> resurrection plant, so it's a, it, you know, lives in a very uh, arid, uh, desert-type climate, and then you add a little bit of water, and then oh, it yeah, just yeah, yeah. turns green, and just, like, see that in, re- in real time happen. They loved it, so... Um, we had a greenhouse. I would, you know, we'd go to the greenhouse on like a little, you know, little field trip, so to speak. Um, it was really uh, amazing. Greenhouses are great, a... especially in the winter, because they're still yeah. nice and warm. You can go in there in the winter, and you're like, ah, this is nice. I got some plants. It smells earthy in here, and you know, it's warm. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I mean, with that earthy smell, and like the, you know, when the flowers are blooming, and um, mm-hmm. And just to be, you know, when it's like cold and dreary and gray outside, to just be around those, <clears throat> I think, you know, just like seeing green, you know, is good for your personal well-being, mm-hmm. I would say. So. Yeah. Yeah. I will add my, one of the thing, tough problems I have with like my city kids, because I teach at a small city school, and getting the kids outside, some of them, is like torturous. It's like, it's like they think I'm trying to kill them. Oh, there's uh-huh. bees out there. There's bees out there. I'm like, you're not allergic. You'll be fine. You might see a bee, <laughs> and it's not gonna, probably not gonna sting you. You know, it. You know, and I'm like, when I was a kid, <laughs> I loved going yeah. outside. You know, for class, it was like, when are we going outside? You know, these kids, it's like, oh, we have to go outside. Like, yes, uh-huh. <laughs> but it's negative twenty degrees. Shut up. Get out there. <laughs> No, uh, <laughs> no. I only take them out when it's nice, usually, because I don't want to go out there. There's sunlight outside, right? <laughs> oh no, oh. that's that sunlight oh, give yeah. you give you a skin cancer. So you know, I I don't know if there's other than just trying to give that opportunities to kids and convincing them to at least try being outside. I don't know how else to really get get those kids to appreciate. You know, just being out there and, you know, being in nature and kind of having that experience. Exactly. I am, you know, I'm someone who just loves, you know, going outside and being outside. Um, So I was, you know, trying to find, uh, you know, find ways to encourage them to, you know, so I always going to try to like say like, oh, today we're going to go out and do this and it's going to be fun. You know, try to like hype them up, you know, hype them up a little bit. So. Yep. Oh yeah. I try to hype it up. They grumbled about mm-hmm. having to go outside, but then they just stayed out there as long as they could because they really enjoyed it. Exactly. Mm-hmm. It's a really, yep. really good point. Yeah. You know, usually once you get them out there, it, it, it's, it's amazing when you're outside, how everyone decompresses a little bit. You yeah. Know? 
it's like once you're out there and you hike a little bit because we have a a little like we call it the hollow where there's like some woods next to our school so we're lucky to have that with a little stream and once you get over there and like you finally get the kids over there and everyone just kind of you know you can see kind of like the shoulders you know relax a little bit and everyone just kind of you know you know they get used to it you know absolutely At least they're, they're, it's hard to read some of them but yeah my wife's chatting that they have a nice school garden so good oh garden. nice oh that's, that's awesome nice to have. but yeah once you get them sometimes some kids it's hard to get them inside once you get them outside but uh absolutely but and i'm kind of so i'm um you know during the lockdown and stuff i got this exercise game um on the Nintendo Switch called mm -hmm. uh, Ring Fit Adventure is what it's called. Okay, yeah, I've heard but, of that. Yeah. But it's like, I'm just like, for some reason, I'm not motivated to do exercise inside. Mm -hmm. So it's like, as soon as I like step outside, then it's like, I can just like walk for hours, I feel like. Like, you know, mm -hmm. you know, once I'm like, but it's just, you know, kind of, like you said, like once you're out there, then you kind of decompress, your shoulders relax a little bit. So it's just like stepping outside the door is the, the main threshold so to speak so yeah i will say i went for a run today when it was like 32 degrees oh, my nice. lungs are still aching right now <laughs> i'm like <laughs> i only stopped like coughing probably like a half an hour before the our, our chat because whew, it was nice brisk air in the upstate new york whew. Oh, but nice. I, I just had to get outside after being cramped inside you know seated teaching for you know an entire day so absolutely i yeah, haven't been running it but i've heard you know really good things about it so <laughs> uh, like i'm just like a you know kind of a you know walker and kind of seeing and it's also interesting because i see so many people um you know running you know this is a very uh, urban spot but mm -hmm. um i feel like i would just look weird running but i think everyone feels like they they look they're gonna look weird so um yeah well i, I walk and hike too because i it, you can't they're for different purposes like running helps me kind of clear my head and you know mm -hmm. get a whole bunch of you know endorphins going and, and stuff like that whereas just going for a walk you can appreciate nature you know and you can look around and you can you know take out your iNaturalist app and, you know, snap some, uh, some species or whatever and, you know, and, and enjoy yourself in the experience. Whereas running, it's kind of just like, whoop, you know, you're doing exactly. it, at least for me, you know, uh, doing it to do it in a way. What I don't understand yeah, is people that run and try to talk while they're running. You know, those groups of people that run and they're like talking to each other while they're running. <laughs> I'm like, how do you do that? I'm like, that's why you hike and you walk, right? You you have a conversation while you're walking. You know, I'm like, I, exactly. it'd be so awkward for me to try to have a conversation while like, hey, how you doing? <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, I worked today. <laughs> no, no, maybe that's just me. I, I, I don't get that, you know exactly or, or, yeah, or the guy that's yeah. like at the at the corner that's still running even though like he's waiting for the you know the, the light to change he's like still running in place <laughs> you're like <laughs> just stop right you can stop for a minute you know? <laughs> wait for the light you have to sit there and run in place for you know 15 minutes <laughs> exactly <clears throat> yeah i love that um you mentioned the iNaturalist stuff that's really amazing so uh yeah i encourage everyone to download that one if they don't don't have it yet you can add me. I should put that on like my Discord so people can add me on their iNaturalist. Oh, that'd be awesome. My dog is the type to smell everything. So all of our walks are very leisurely. Oh, my dogs are the same way. My my, my two dogs, they just sniff everything because there's so many dogs in our neighborhood and they have to sniff every footprint and every spot of pee and then <laughs> pee on it themselves, walk one foot maybe until there's another thing to sniff. You know, so <laughs> walks are very leisurely. <laughs> yep. Yeah, there's um, this very strange spider species that I came across that I was meaning to put that on that on iNaturalist, but I haven't done that yet. But I that reminded me to put that up there because I'm curious, like, what is this thing? 
there is speaking of spider there's a there's a streamer who goes by spider id and he <sighs> where is he out of i think from finland or so one of the scandinavian countries i think and all he does on his stream is identify spiders so that is kind of you know if that's your thing you can uh, help him identify spiders that's what he does for his research so oh nice so i can hear you still i had to run out for a sec but yeah and those, those insect and like spider identification people are like crazy like the minutia yeah. that they get into to identify something this spiracle is a half a degree to the left so therefore we know it is not this subspecies you know and you're just like what <laughs> <laughs> it's this really has two instead of three dots under its you know interior you know meniscus abdomen you know and you're like <laughs> Wow, okay. It's incredible. Uh, <laughs> Here's the <laughs> confused flower beetle. My favorite is confused flower beetle. <laughs> nice. Always confused for a flower beetle. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. It's funny how they're like different groups of like, especially biologists. I don't know about chemists, but like, like birders are like a unique group of people, you know, Absolutely. whereas the insect, you know, people, even lepidopterists are their own little like enclave, like cult of, you know, you know, so I think it's kind of interesting. I remember the first time I hung out with birders, I'm like, these people are crazy. <laughs> they're, like, they're like, yeah, we're going to stay up drinking until two in the morning. Then we're going to wake up at three. Yeah. <laughs> what? <laughs> How do you do that? <laughs> well, the birds go to bed again at like eight, so we sleep. It's like, oh, God, you're crazy. <laughs> yeah, I've been, um, I got into birding very recently. I did an online class that was really, uh, really amazing. And um, yeah, I've seen some really, uh, really amazing birds around here. Got a peregrine falcon one time, mm -hmm. um, great blue herons. Um, there are these birds called, I think my favorite bird that, I, that I've seen out there, it's called the black skimmer. I don't know if you've heard of this one, but it looks mm -hmm. very unique. Um, and they uh, they have like, their pupil is like vertical slit, kind of like a, looks like a dinosaur eye kind of. Um, mm -hmm. They're really incredible. Cool. So, it's kind of yeah, Gath Wagle does say that there are the subcultures in chemistry as well. Those organic mm -hmm. chemists versus analytical chemists. And physical chemists. I can see that, I guess. Mm -hmm. But onto the biology again, important thing to note about the birds as they fly down the Hudson River as one of their migration routes. So, you know, from Canada, you know, all the way down, you know, the, the Hudson River into New York City, you know, and then south from there. So that's why New York City is a great place for birding because you have a whole lot of species there. I mean, I mean, the Meadowlands is, you know, it. A great place to look at birds because it's you know a bird sanctuary for the aquatic birds so absolutely yeah i want to get up there to do some birding um you know when it gets warmer <laughs> um <laughs> yeah here it's even like you know central park there's a, so many different species and everything it's really amazing yep well we have been talking for over an hour well, that's amazing. It does not feel that long at all. No, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. Um, and before we finish it up, I have a, a game we're going to play. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of like two truths and a lie. Okay. Um, so I have three questions for you that you're going to have to try to answer. Now, you'll benefit from your background in sci-fi for these because you nice. work in plant immunology where plants are protecting themselves, but these are going to be questions about fictional plants that attack and are aggressive. All right. And so uh, are you ready for these questions? I'm excited. You're excited. Okay, good. All right. Question one, what are the most famous attacking plants 
is Audrey 2 of Little Shop of Horrors. Which of the following actually happened during uh, the, uh, the filming of the movie? A, filming the movie, Rick Moranis became hopelessly entangled in the tentacles and machinations of the puppet plant at the end of the first rehearsal. Five cast members spent half an hour extracting him from the plant. That was choice A. Or is it B? And the spoiler for anyone that hasn't seen this. Okay. Uh, the original version of the show had Audrey 2 eating both the leads and everyone else in the cast. Its brood then conquered the rest of the world after test screenings, though. Frank Oz changed the ending based on the frigid response of the audience. So, so far we have A, Rick Moranis getting stuck in the plant for half an hour, or B, uh, there was an original ending uh, where the plant, you know, conquered the entire world. Or is it C, technicians built an immense Audrey II puppet requiring 30 people to control and was 12 feet high. So which wow, one of those okay, is true? So the first two options, the first one sounds hilarious. I'm trying to like imagine him um, getting stuck for that long. The second one, it sounds, it's just like so specific that it seems like it could also be true. Um, I'm wondering, I'm trying to think like logistically, like changing the ending and um, yeah, it sounds like, yeah, Frank, that was Frank Oz's idea. I'm going to say, man, it would be hilarious. I'm going to discount C because it's, that just seems like too boring and standard. I feel like, so I'm going to, I'm going to discount C. So I'm like 50, 50 between A and B. I'll go with B. You are right. That is Oh, true. nice. Awesome. So they had originally, they have the original ending still, I guess you can get it in the director's cut um, that they scrapped because, you know, audience just didn't want to see the two leads die and the plants conquer the world. I, I don't know. Uh, I want to see that <laughs> alternate ending now. <laughs> sounds amazing. I know. It, it, it sounds scary, but like I, I want to... Um, sounds almost like a horror movie at that point. All right, Uncle Bill guessed A. That was a, that was a good guess. I thought that would be funny too to see Rick Moranis tuck stuck in all the tail. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so funny, funny. All right. Uh, next one. All right. Question two. One of the most famous attacking plant video games is Plants vs. Zombies. Which was an original title for the game that got scrapped? Was it A, Lawn of the Dead? B, Night of the Living Dicots, C, <laughs> Green and Mean. I love Night of the Living Dicots. I'm going to scrap that one because it seems a little bit, if you're not a scientist, maybe it might be a little bit too, uh, you might not get it. Um, I like C also, but I'm going to go with A just because like, I would love that title. And it's also kind of like, play on like Shaun of the Dead and everything. I don't know if there's like a copyright thing maybe, but that's my guess. And you are exactly right. And that's why they couldn't use okay. Lawn of the Dead because it was a copyright issue. Oh. It sounded too much okay. like Dawn of the Dead and Shaun of the Dead and all the other ones. So, so very good. You're already, right. you got two right already. So the la no this last one's, that's this last one's gravy for you. All right. So question three, and this one's about everyone's favorite plant from uh, the Marvel Universe, Groot. Nice. Uh, Groot from Guardians of the Galaxy is one of the most kick-ass plants in the universe. When Groot first arrived on Earth, in uh, as told in the Astonished number 13, what did he do? So what did he do when he first arrived to Earth? Was it A... He visited a paper factory, cried, and then destroyed it. 
and a nearby mm -hmm. by logging mill and just went on a rampage after that, destroying paper mills and, and, and paper factories and logging mills. Was it B, he declared his invincibility and went around capturing humans to take back his planet for experimentation? Or C, he came in an, a uh, meteor that landed in Siberia, which planted him in the ground, and where he grew up and was eventually found by Captain America during one of his Cold War missions and was taught to say, I am Groot. Wow, that's a tough one. <clears throat> They all three sound pretty believable. I'm trying to think. I remember looking at the the cover of the comic from his original appearance, and he looked scary. Like, he was, like, big and, like, I think he was, like, destroying a building or something. Um, so that kind of fits with A and B. Uh, it's, it's again, it's, like, a 50-50 between A and B for me. Um, could also be C this time. I'm going to go with... I'm gonna, I'll go with B since it sounds like terrifying, and I remember the cover sounded pretty terrifying. I don't know about him like crying in a paper thing. Like I don't, that seemed a little bit. I don't know how emotional he would be. You are correct. B is right. You're, you went three for three. Oh, awesome. <laughs> nice job. Nice job. I got to come up with better distractors. You know, for my no, those for are all. Nice. I'm always like tossed up between all those. <laughs> I'm surprised that I got them. No, uh, yeah, so he actually, uh, and in the original comic, in that when he came to Earth, he could actually speak more than just I am Groot, too. So when I was doing research for this, I came across that little fact. So when he originally came to Earth uh, from Planet X, he could actually speak. So I was not aware of that. So guess oh, what? I learned awesome. something by doing some research today. Uh, Except only in the movie, it's like he... That's all you can say basically is I am Groot, I am Groot. So yep. <laughs> that's awesome. Yep. So it's surprising that he could actually speak at one point. So I mm -hmm. did have some other I had some other ideas for that about like sci-fi. I don't know what other sci-fi you were into when you were younger, but like there's the Triffids, which were plants. The the original the thing was part plant, um, if I remember right. Um I'm trying to think what some there's of the other so Well, and then there's the the Ents from uh, Lord of the Rings, right? Yep, the ants from Lord of the Rings. Um, and there were so many. I mean, I'm like, like Avatar, the, uh, mm -hmm. you know, the trees that are yep. connected with the planet and everything. Um, well, they're actually finding that out now about trees here on Earth, how interconnected the trees are as term is it's less of competition so much as that it's more cooperation uh, amongst trees and you know which kind of you know upends a lot of our thinking that everything in you know natural selection is just all competition you know you know everything for yourself or these plants obviously that's not the case um, so that's also interesting side research absolutely though. yes yeah, if anyone wants to um, you know, do some uh, Googling on that, it's really fascinating. Um, these, like, root systems that are interconnected with mycorrhizae and everything and signal exchange over through the whole, you know, through whole forests and stuff. It's really amazing. Hmm. Oh, Doctor Who uh, came up in the chat here. Um, I'm a big Doctor Who fan. Oh, yeah, yeah, Tom Baker getting trapped in the uh, scarf. That's funny. <laughs> it's over four meters long. I'm glad they kept the scarf. Yeah, because that's like uh, his defining, one of his defining traits, I feel like. So. Yep. Iconic. Exactly. Yeah, that's a great, great, uh, great word for that. Yeah, for sure. Well, thank you for being here. Um, it is... I don't know what time you usually go to bed, but uh, um, I got work tomorrow. So it's usually getting close to my yeah, bedtime. So unless I want to fall asleep weird. in front of a bunch of eighth graders, you know, first thing tomorrow morning, I should probably go to sleep oh. at some point. Um, 
today. So and what we'll do is what we usually do here on Twitch. I'm going to see if I can find someone to raid since we have a bunch of wonderful viewers here today. Thank you for hanging out and chatting with us and talking with us. Uh, I, I really appreciate you being here and being part of all uh, the fun that we're having. So uh, let's see. I had a lot of fun. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Thanks. Thank you, Scott, so much for... The invitation and being an awesome you know i really had a lot of fun good and uh one thing that you can do for me of course spread the word i'm always looking for more guests i do have for next week um yinang uh wang is going to be here he is the fossil locator on twitter um and he oh, wrote nice. the book um about the 50 state fossils so talking paleontology uh next week so, oh, that's awesome. Y'all have to show up for that one. That sounds fascinating. There we go. We're going to go visit Constabel. So she <laughs> is a news streamer, and she's very, uh, very good. There she is. So be sure to hang out, say hi. She's talking about science, art, and society tonight. So we'll hang out there for a little bit. Oh, we'll nice. See how she's doing. So it'll happen in about five seconds. And yeah, she's new. So be friendly to her. Say, say nice things. Um, and thanks for being here, everybody. Bye. Thank you so much, Scott. I really, really appreciate it. Hey, not a problem. Love it. I had a, I had a good time. Yeah, I had a lot, a lot of fun. <laughs> Your questions were amazing. I was, I was stumped on all those. Oh my gosh, was... fun streams. Hey, hey, Uncle Bill. Hey again, you brought some friends? So. Science. That's mm -hmm. awesome. Welcome. Welcome, 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 right. welcome, welcome. 